Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 82nd edition of Airhex TV, the uh, first edition in 2021. And welcome all the uh, attendees from the meetup. And by the way, uh, in 2020, so late 2020, I started the uh, Airhex meetup group and we have already 360, um, how to call it, participants, or I call them Air Hackers, uh, community members. And I will announce um, more and more shows on meetup.com. Uh, so let's start with um, with the content. And um, so let's start with the very first question. Or oh, bef before we start with the question, so um, the last Airhex Live uh, workshops are um, around the corner. Also, they they, they happened uh, December 10th and 11th. It was um, Quarkus with MicroProfile and uh, web components, van um, so building uh, applications with vanilla web components, Redux and Lit HTML. Both uh, workshops were packed, so um, I actually wanted to close the uh, session, but um, I didn't have the dates for 2021 yet, uh, so I uh, I just allowed. I think we have around 30 attendees for uh, um, um, for each day, and it was a uh, lots of fun. And I got actually during the workshops idea for two more shows. And by the way, um, one new show is already announced, and this is the Monolith Microservices uh, Serverless Event Driven Architectural Styles, and. What I got asked during the workshop is like, you know, what about monolith and what about microservices? And in this workshop, what I try to do is I will cover as um, as many architectures as possible with pros, uh, 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 pros and cons and uh, with, um, if available, of course, um, uh, source code and uh, we will discuss. So it should be fun. So there will be uh, far more far less slides than the architecture course last year and we it's already announced the built uh, event driven application with streams logs and messages so this was the um so the first workshop it was uh, a feedback from the quarkus workshop where i got lots of questions regarding uh, architectures so um the um agenda is not done yet but i will cover so if you have any suggestions so just i will put it to the agenda so this course is open for registrations as well so now um, what I also uh, got questions during or du during the so the um, web components workshop uh, went also well, and we built a small app with um, lit HTML and Redux and routing. Um, so, but um, the feedback was so there were um, some um, Angular um, developers and uh, React developers that say, okay, everything is great, but if we, they would start you know with vanilla web components, there are um, there are actually no best practices what to do um, and if you you know uh, um, um, writing an, an angular application then you get the code generator which generated the, the entire skeleton for you and uh, you get you know the generated uh, best practices so what i thought is i will offer two more courses so it, they will come after the um the courses i already um, do, um uh, announced uh, they, they are in March, and the um, this one I'm thinking about is April or May, and the working title is, is going to be best practices with um, vanilla web components, and the reason being is I'm so I'm, I'm I watch myself developing you know applications uh, again and again, and what I found that there are some common ideas around um, around naming structure which are working well for me, so I would like just to share it with you during the workshop. And, um, and the next one is um, how to build um, mobile applications with web components. They should behave like uh, with, with service workers. So we will focus in the second workshop just on uh, mobile, uh, offline, and, um, and, um, and uh, yeah, uh, installation of mobile devices, caching, and stuff like that. So, um, so two new ideas. So thank you for that. It just uh, happened. Um, during the workshop, and um, I will announce them soon, probably next week or something like this. So I share you with with you first. So um, this is uh, um, in March 18th, I guess. The uh, the uh, mobile workshops are going to be in April. So next thing, what you already see is um, I will come back to the to the spirit of uh, airhacks.com. So the idea was our it's everything started you now with Java E workshops, and the idea was. I will start with uh, with basics, and then give you, you know some some month um, to think about the questions, and then I will start with the second part. 
and it worked well but uh the um you know the there were um, attendees from all over the world and they wanted to attend everything in one week so what we did is i just you know offered a block of three uh, three consecutive days but uh, in online workshop we don't have to do it so um i think it is easier and more fun that uh, you see there is some room five days between the first workshop and the second i will do the same in the, uh, for the mobile part in april or may where I will start with the first workshop and one week later or two weeks later with the second. So you can ask questions. I think we don't have to do it, you know, uh, in the online fashion one day after another. So now um, this is that, then the podcast. So there are two um, interesting episodes or multiple episodes. So one is with uh, Sharas Chandar, and this is the product manager of Java SE, actually. So this is, um, if you would like to know how, how he started, just listen to this episode and is also a episode uh, Sharath was also program chair of uh, Java one and um, he also started uh, the NetBeans team so interesting episode and uh, there were two episodes about Halidon and reactive programming with Halidon also very interesting is one with how to deal with Java dependencies and and this one uh, we um, uh, this was um, with uh, Michael uh, Boltz from uh, SAP and how to deal with dependencies and um, and uh, they, they had um, an open source tool called uh, Fast Stars Rating Core and so we had a chat you know about uh, dependencies and um, there are lots of questions regarding dependencies during the show so if you're interested just listen to it okay now uh, Christo gave me you know a hard time with his feedback excellent feedback by the way regarding the course uh, web components with Redux and lit HTML. So what I did is in my recent uh, uh, application, which is uh, commercial, so I cannot share the code, but I said, okay, let's start with the uh, Redux toolkit instead of Redux plain. And I used parts of Redux toolkit as already explained during the show or, um, and um, so I used the uh, Redux uh, toolkit, not everything from it, but I created actions. I created the reducers with the builders from Redux uh, toolkit and it worked well. But uh, what uh, I, I don't see uh, the part is this DAX, uh, this is DAX module pattern. So I got a lot of controls with lots of code. So this, is, this was not a problem at all. And, um, and the, entity, um, the entity folder, works still great with uh, Redux Toolkit. So Redux Toolkit um, is a good idea. I'm not sure, still not sure whether I would start with it. So um, I think if you are new to Redux, I will start with Redux Plane and you always can move to Redux Toolkit. But um, yeah, but uh, great feedback again. Thank you for this. We already discussed this at the um, 81st edition of um, AXDV, but uh, yeah. So thank you for that. Now, and now to the first question. And the very first question is regarding glue.org and uh, Mr. Oh, there is no first name and not last name. So it's Vibe Vaf Kulkani. And what he said is uh, uh, just check out glue. And glue is great. So if you take a look at glue, there's even a book about glue. So this is uh, the uh, glue identity server. And what I did last year is I evaluated the this glue from github and it was for a commercial project so what i did is i evaluated keycloak and glue and um, of course if it will run on my uh, client uh, machines so what they expect if there's a docker image they they would like to, uh, to have you know their own uh, operating systems and uh, and certs and so forth and with glue it was not that easy at least last year or uh, early last year to, uh, to create a Docker image from scratch, you know, with my own operating system, CentOS or what, whatever, in my own Java, and then, and then put, you know, the glue dependencies on it. So the image was huge from glue, and uh, so Keycloak was way easier to handle. And, um, and what um, the feedback from, from uh, Christo was, thanks for pointing to me to glue. It sounds as ambitious as uh, Ori, the, uh, dot s, but it's not free. Uh, I think glue is free, so um, it was absolutely free. It's open source. What I also did uh, have some experience with is an old uh, Sun Identity Platform um, uh, product, and but uh, the interesting part is it's still alive, but it was archived five years ago, so that there is no further development. And what happened? It was forked 
to the open identity platform, which continues to be developed in, in, in the open. And um, I have uh, right now experience with that and never tried the open the open source version of it, but it worked well so far. So you can you get the open ID connect. And this one was uh, Sun product, so it was Glassfish based and the uh, key cloak is Whitefly or JBoss based. And I think uh, from the simplicity, key cloak is still, you know, very easy to install. Okay, so this is that. And uh, yeah, this was the, the closed one. And Glue, of course, you can buy support from Glue, but you can also run it as an open source alternative. And uh, Christo said uh, it uses AWS Cognito, which is great if you're running in AWS Cloud, but of course, it's not portable. So now, then Mr. Omar Alvarez, friend of the show, says, okay, what they would like to do is they would have would like to have multiple Jakarta E8 monolith uh, with JAXRS to retrieve data from each other. And uh, so, I mean, monolith, what means monolith? Um, I mean, for me, monolith would mean, you know, a reasonable uh, thin war application, which is great. And, and, and he is thinking about using Hazelcast data grid for it. So you can absolutely use it. I actually um, even use that and even describe that in the uh, microservice workshop. I used um, Hazel, uh, Hazelcast. I also used Hazelcast for, uh, on my servers for configuration and data distribution. So uh, a great product. So what Hazelcast is, is basically you know, Java collections of steroids. So you can put something into Java collection and the, the data in the collection replicates to all nodes. So, the, and um, the, you can even use, you know, um, Hazelcast for eventing. So if you put something in, in a hash map, let's say, you get notify on, uh, notified on other nodes that, um, that uh, data was changed. By the way, what I forgot to mention is, ah, you see uh, our chat. So I use the AXTV chat and of course, uh, happy new, or or not happy, uh, hacky new 2021. Okay, so um, thank you all. So, so oh, I think we should use this chat in, in favor of uh, uh, textual. So you can still ask questions here. And Keycloak X was powered by Quarkus. Uh, perfect. So um, I would check that out. So and uh, I always use so far the uh, JBoss based Quarkus version in production evaluations. Never tried that with Quarkus, but if Quarkus, even better. Um, okay. Now, um, what is the experience with such technologies? So um, it's this complete different uh, architecture. So with uh, with Hazelcast, is almost like Kafka without persistence, I would say, right? So, um, and uh, what uh, um, what is even available for Hazelcast is a GMS. Um, so you can use, you know, that there was like a basic implementation of GMS over Hazelcast. So what do you have to be careful with, of course, is uh, cl um, class pass. Um, because if you share something between between the nodes, uh, all the nodes will have to have, you know, the same class in the class path. And of course, uh, this is, the problem in you this could be a problem in your case because uh, if you have you know two nodes and you put let's say a serialized Java object to Hazelcast which is not a good idea um, then you cannot deserialize the object does not exist on the other node so but if you're using JSON this w just works great so what um, I used back then with Hazelcast is I use uh, JavaScript Nashorn back then, and Nashorn can implement Java interfaces. So uh, I could just you know store the Nashorn uh, logic as a uh, as a string to Hazelcast. It was redistributed to all the nodes, and, and the data moved you know around the nodes and and was directly usable. You can do the same right now with Gravium. Um, and we don't have enough resources to do microservices. Um, I mean, microservices done right, I mean, micro, forget the term microservices, like, you know, right size monolith should be as easy, right? So what it means is uh, exaggerated microservice, right? So you don't have resources to, to have microservices. So, so which option do you have? Uh, you have uh, Hazelcast, which means you only would like to communicate or Kafka, it would mean I don't uh, like to communicate. I would like to have, you know, the state of the application starts uh, somewhere else. So this would be the other an option. So uh, so Hazelcast with data grid combined with Payara is a good idea because Payara supports native, natively 
Hazelcast. So if you like Payara and like Hazelcast, go for it. Um, so the challenges are, as I said, don't try you know, to, to store serialized uh, objects there. But what you can absolutely do, you can have you know one Jaxrs add points, which which stores the JSON data to the um, Hazelcast Hazelcast grid, which gets distributed, and then the the other nodes just you know pick the data and process process them. Th this would work. Hope it's clear. So Cristobal, uh, by the way, uh, he started with uh, Spectrum 48K. Uh, he was 10 years old. I think I was 10 or 12 and I started with 128K uh, Amstrad. And uh, yeah, it was a uh, great fun. So um, greeting to Spain. Um, is there a way to have a new managed uh, executor services programmatically in Glassfish Payara? So to my knowledge, no, but what I created, what it can do is it, um, or there is, <laughs> there is, and, um, but different than you expect. So uh, what I used is a project called Porcupine, hopefully Porcupine, uh, exactly. And this uh, Porcupine project, so what I can do is I can just put it here and to the chat and the Parcupine project uses the um, the uh, Jakarta E or Java E concurrency uh, utilities spec, and you can create executor services on the fly. So um, and it was already used in production by multiple uh, projects. So take take a look on that. So uh, um, I don't use it anymore because uh, what I use right now is I use uh, micro profile. Um, um, full tolerance, which comes with bulkheads and async, which behaves almost like this. And in one point of so, and and if you have Spyara or Whitefly, they also support microprofile, so you can use this in favor of that. <laughs> you can use this in favor of that. You can use microprofile uh, um, um, uh, instead of uh, GSR concurrency releases for Java TM because yeah, the server supports both. Um, so, um, and is this a good practice to have several managed executor services? Um, absolutely, it's a very good practice because if you have multiple executor services, what do you get there? Uh, the, you get the pattern called bulkheads. So, um, what you can do is you can have you know instead of having one um, executor service with 100 threads, you can have you know 10 executor services with 10 threads each, and then you can you uh, you can have you know. Um, you can say for this resource, I only would like, you know, to uh, or this resource is only capable to handle 10 parallel transactions. So this is how we can partition partition the concurrency. And um, what can happen is then the, all the executor services will will die because, you know, Project Loom is on the horizon. So um, threads become cheap, but then you will use probably semaphores on other constructs to uh, to guard the external services. Uh, to um, to or guard to to save them from overloading, right? To protect, not guard, protect them uh, from overload. Uh, so right now, very good practice. Um, and uh, the problem is what I always um, or sometimes see in projects is project are using you know at asynchronous without any thinking for the uh, configuration. And then I ask also, you know, if you use asynchronous, you know, in which thread pool is is it actually executed? So how the thread pool is configured, and uh, no one knows, right? So and if the um, and if the entire application is based on a thread pool with ten or threads or ten is bad and ten thousand is also bad. So ten means is uh, um, you 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 have a bottleneck, and if you have uh, ten thousand threads configured, then you have the problem that you, the application will one point of time, you know. A crash with out of memory. So um, then, Alok asked me, uh, in today's software development process, how much Gengo 4 design patterns play a role? I would say um, they don't play a huge role for years because they are already part of the platform. That I mean, they are still there, but they are invisible. Let's say you know singleton. It's not like you have to know you know uh, how to build a singleton with synchronized and you know I don't know whether you remember you know the discussions like double check and you know uh, how to create a proper Gengo for singleton with all the tricks because what you do right now you just put you know application scoped on on an object and you get your singleton 
or uh, factory. I think factories are, 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 are no more existing because we have dependency injection. You, you, you say at inject and if you have at producers, I would call it a factory, but actually uh, it is just a you know, producer method. No one will call this a gang of a factory pattern, but behind the scenes it really is. Then the adapter pattern is just trivial, I would say. And this is why um, you say, okay, we have one, you know, compatible interface and um, we've wrapped the incompatible interface and now we have adapter. So um, with uh, constructor injection, you have adapter pattern basically. So um, I would say it is good to know it, but uh, it is not like you have to know, you know, the source code, how this is implemented because it's already implemented by MicroProfile in Jakarta E basically. Um, yeah. So um, I would say they're always a little bit exaggerated. So there was a famous, you know, uh, anecdote where uh, there was Eric Gamma. Uh, Eric is the father of Gang of Four patterns, and someone during the conference stood up and said, "I used all your Gang of Four patterns," and Eric said, "You are crazy, right? Uh, you don't don't do this." And um, so what it means is um, you have to know. For instance, you, you, at least you you will have to have a feeling, you know. You say, "Okay." Um, in December, I was involved in a code review, and what I did is they introduced an interface to uh, to between uh, um, to, for communication between modules in in Jakarta e or MicroProfile. MicroProfile was a Quarkus project, and I asked them, "You know, this is highly unusual. What you are doing? Why are you doing this?" And they had good explanation for it, which was fine. So, but what I introduced is a factory, which was actually uh, unusual, or it is unusual in Jakarta e and MicroProfile, but they had good reason for it. So, I would say knowing all the patterns is very good for communication, but the, uh, um, I would say. Um, you don't have to use factories, adapters, decorators, and and proxies in your uh, Jakarta and MicroProfile applications all the time, right? So, so now um, just just a pointer for me. So uh, vanilla web components in 2021. So what it means is, um, so I get a feeling that, that they should actually really took off, um, uh, take off. Why? Um, because uh, I think I think the first time the web components, all the web components workshop are. Uh, uh, as popular as Jakarta, MicroProfile, and Quarkus. Uh, usually they were not as popular. I just you know, believed in this, uh, so I uh, kept to push them. But right now there was like uh, the, the, exactly the same amount of attendees in both workshops in, in December. And uh, what I really like is the feedback. If I sh present this technology to developers, all Java developers like that. So some say, okay, we need some more guidance, but uh, it was, they always say, okay, it's easier to learn than we thought. So I think they should take off. And what I also notice is that even, you know, the um, frameworks are moving towards, you know, simpler, uh, simpler, how to call it, tooling, like, uh, you know, Webpack is not that, you know, uh, sexy anymore. So um, I would say, in 2021 or um, uh, 2022, it should really take off. In, in, in my world, it already happened. So uh, my queue of project is almost full. So I'm right now building uh, two apps, which are based, completely based on web components without any frameworks. And um, the developers are happy and my clients are also happy. So uh, what I also thought about a lot is, um, because um, you will see in a second uh, a question. And the question is, where is it? Adam Bean blog. I got some questions from uh, from the comments, and this is um, so. So I know several people are trying uh, their best to push Java, Jakarta, Pyre, Red Hat, but those technologies are in decline, and this is what I don't see at all. And I actually see the opposite. Um, the The question is if you. If uh, this is if you see Jakarta E, what are you thinking about? Because Jakarta E, Jakarta E, if you go to the specifications, so they are all the specifications, right? So I, I would say you will hardly find a Java project without an API from Jakarta E. So let's say you have a project with a bin validation. And let's say, what else? Uh, interceptors. So is it now Jakarta E project or not? Right? So uh, how to classify? So what it means if you are, you are building Jakarta E project? It means 
you he have to use all the APIs at once. So then I'm with you. So I I, I think I was never in a Jakarta project where we use Node the entire platform, but. Um, uh, I would say even in Quarkus project, we use a lot of Jakarta e APIs. So um, I, I don't even know what it means uh, if someone says, you know, Jakarta is on, on decline. So what it means that uh, we don't use, you know, the interceptors anymore, pin validation is that, uh, JAXORS is no more used, or, or dependency injection is not used. So, so what it means. And um, micro profile is more clear because in micro profile, I think, you know, if you hear micro profile, I hear more like you know matrix and uh, and and health and and, and configuration jakarta are thinking more about you know dependency injection the basic stuff so um so what i think is that um java um could be more popular and what i also expect is that maybe even you know some new project will start with micro profile and jakarta e and it could become a little bit more popular than in 20, 2020 so i don't see the decline and uh, also um, um, people are just curious and you know they're curious about uh, about Helidon or about Quarkus but even Quarkus or Helidon project we use a lot from Jakarta E so um, so servlets I mean if you have used servlets is it now a Jakarta E project or not right <laughs> uh, back then we had you know the uh, distinction between EJB containers and web containers but now um, this is just the distinction is not mentioned very often so um, if someone mentions Jakarta is on decline, I would be ju just curious to know what does this exactly mean, right? So uh, a, a very fresh question uh, two hours ago. Um, so and and by the way, so um, uh, I just forgot the uh, to to cover the question. This was Quarkus with NetBeans, and. Um, so and now the question is, uh, can I use Quarkus with Spring Boot? And actually, you absolutely can. Uh, Quarkus even comes with uh, with Spring Boot API without um, without uh, coming with Spring Boot dependencies. So it understands these Spring Boot annotations and implements this by in the Quarkus way. And why they did it? So there's a longer story. You will have to search for. Uh, Vodafone, we covered this already, Vodafone, Quarkus, uh, Spring Boot to Quarkus migration. And uh, if you go to YouTube, it's more interesting because uh, the developers actually. So search for that. And uh, this is an um, uh, episode where they discuss why they did it and what's the idea behind. Okay, so now... Um, is NetBeans even used anymore? And outside Oracle, so I know the lots of uh, Oracle engineers they use uh, um, IntelliJ. So um, this was mostly always the case, and some use NetBeans. And what I also know is that in Graal VM development, uh, NetBeans is huge. And I have to admit, um, um, or admit, I like uh, NetBeans still, and I use NetBeans in larger Java projects. And um, um, I would expect, you know, um, marketing. Aside, uh, NetBeans is a great IDE, so I don't see any reason, you know, to drop NetBeans. Um, it is actually nothing changed, right? So, um, what changes? You don't need that many plugins to be productive with MicroProfile and Jakarta E, and NetBeans comes with great Maven support. So I use Visual Studio Code and NetBeans all the time. And actually, uh, I would like uh, I use uh, the um, the JetBrains tool a little bit more this year. I use DataGrip a lot. And uh, I also plan to play a little bit with Python. Why not? And um, and uh, then I was I think it's called uh, Pi Pi something Pi Charm or something like this. And um, yeah, uh, IntelliJ. Um, if I get time, I would also I have the license. I have the um, uh, it's called Workbench license or um, where I have all the tools. But there's still no time. So and and Visual Studio Code and NetBeans just worked uh, too well or very well for me. Okay, now. We covered my uh, blog question as well, uh, specifications, and this was that. <laughs> this was that. So um, now, um, how should we think in cloud native? Um, this is the question from Odemis. Odemis, how should we think in cloud native environment compared to native local development, where we code our monolith on local environment against a local application server? So um, for me, no difference. So, um, for instance, uh, the recent project I used uh, Quarkus, 
and um, I used uh, the uh, the um, Quarkus.dev or Quarkus colon dev environment. Held it on the same, Pyara the same, by the way. And what happens then is I push it somewhere to usually uh, GitHub or Bitbucket. And then, uh, you know, the CI process kicks in and I expect, you know, to, to the entire thing to be deployed in view minutes uh, somewhere. And um, I did it even on stage. So this is the question. Can you present some developer workflow for cloud native environments, for example, with AWS services? And this is what I actually did. There was a um, online workshop or online session, free session. This is a document on YouTube and it's called um, Serverless Java. And at the end uh, of the show, I just pushed uh, uh, Quarkus as a uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda service is exactly what I did. So I can watch that. And my uh, my uh, log, my commercial workflow workflow is not that different. Um, what I uh, use, uh, usually do is I automate the process a little bit more. For instance, in um, AKS or, or Kubernetes, I use the uh, AKS cattle from uh, from Amazon or uh, or uh, Terraform or or CloudFormation. So this is what I didn't used in the in the uh, session. Um, and uh, the next question was about ECS. So this is an older um, screencast. So it is 2017. But what I did here, I pushed a, a Java E service to uh, ECS. And what uh, ECS, um, this is the uh, Elastic Container Service. The uh, the Fargate is just a, uh, a how to call it, a, a dialect. So this is just a config ECS uh, configuration. So the, between Fargate and ECS is not it is not a huge difference. Um, it's just configuration. So what Fargate is more like uh, Kubernetes. So in ECS you will have to provision. The, you you will start you know with EC2 machines and so far and, and so forth. And with Fargate the entire process is automated. And and uh, what my impression is that Fargate gets a little bit more popular and uh, Kubernetes popularity declines a bit. So this is my, uh, or, um, and, and this is not about Fargate. The, uh, the Azure cloud has something uh, in, uh, similar. It's called Azure Container Instances. Okay, so this is also, you can watch that. And by the way, we can push both to the chat. Uh, so, Valdemar asked me, if you use Microprof application with Jakarta e and .NET services, is Jakarta e's application or .NET? Uh, this is, a, maybe this is, um, I don't get, Jakarta e and .NET services. So, um, I mean, if you access them remotely. It's hard to tell. This is both, right? I mean, uh, and .NET services. I think you can. This is like you know the uh, Windows communication framework is the is the next version of that, and um, I, I don't know what to answer to that. Um, yeah, but uh, Yuka is the, uh, is the, likes the answer, so thank you. And I don't get this. Um, I mean, no one cares how it's called, right? But uh, Jakarta can access .NET services, and they, um, but. .NET can, ex if you expose something, you know, in .NET via, let's say, REST and JSON, you can just access this from Microprofile REST client directly. Uh, and uh, and Jakarta e and Microprofile is not a huge difference because, be, be, be because all the Jakarta e runtimes, I know, all the servers also support Microprofile at the same time. So I will just push that to the chat so you have the reference. Okay. So, um, exactly. Uh, and local remote debugging, fairly easy. So what you can do at the end of the day, it is in machines and, uh, for instance, Amazon, because you already, uh, you're already saying Lambda, API Gateway and Fargate, and Fargate is Amazon. So on Am Amazon is uh, EC2 machines and you can get shell access to the machines. And if you have shell access, you have a network access and then you can expose a debug por a port and do whatever you like. So, I mean, yeah. So I would say, this, this cloud native term is a little bit overused. I would say if we build, if you are building, you know, reasonable Jakarta e applications, we always were a cloud native, right? And if your applications were 
you know, uh, I would say built like, which were not, how to call it? There were some, how, how it's called, they were hated by developers, but we had EJB programming restrictions, right? And developers didn't like that. It's like, okay, we are restricted and they, they tried to you know hacks like, you know, to implement uh, GNI access in servlets or uh, access to local file systems in servlets, not in EJBs, which was crazy. But um, but if you do did it properly back then, now you you, you are you know cloud native. So um, yeah, I would say the, the only thing is the configuration. So as usually the configuration is uh, externalized. So and uh, a few years ago, developers loved you know to build their own configuration frameworks, which are pointless right now because the application is configured externally. Yeah. Now uh, Hans Pickemart ask me. I have two Pyara servers, but not running in Pyara cluster. A load balancer distributes loads over the two servers. I'm using Eclipse Link, and I want to use Eclipse Link cache coordination and preferably, preferably Hazel class to handle the cache invalidation on the other servers. In this possible without using Pyara cluster, with um, I tried, but no success. It should be because I did this with Glassfish 3 without cluster, and it worked. So, I mean, this is the configuration of uh, Eclipse Link. And if you search for Eclipse Link, Eclipse Link cache coordination, you will find that the problem, what you probably have is Pyara ships already with Hazelcast. And then if you try you know, to access the Hazelcast, then you get the problem. But um, if you just would you know, deactivate the Pyara's Hazelcast and ship your own Hazelcast, then it should just work. Um, and uh, the cache invalidation we used back then, I think JMS, uh, or another protocol, the protocol is... Uh, so I don't think you have to use, I mean, you don't have to use Hazelcast for cache invalidation because the cache invalidation is simple. Like uh, you, what, what happens behind the scenes is, is just the key is broadcasted and all the caches forget the key. So this is what happens behind the scenes. Uh, so second question, can I use Hazelcast for Eclipse Link cache coordination when running MicroProf instead of full Pyara server? So and um, now the... I think the problems you have is, is the uh, problems because Pyara comes with well-integrated Hibernate. So my answer would be you could actually use Eclipse Link without server in JUnit test with Hazelcast and the, and the cluster should work. And if it doesn't in Pyara, it's just because you know Pyara prevents uh, Hazelcast configuration. I didn't try that uh, on Pyara. I did it the last time with Glassfish. And... Um, and what I did is I tried, you know, um, ex what, what I said, what I usually do, I tried everything outside of Pyara in, uh, in a um, integration test, where in unit tests you can, uh, you can boot Eclipse Link with Hazelcast and just try whether it works in principle. And then, it, you know, try to see why it doesn't work in, in Pyara case. So um, I think we are done. This was a, sh a short show as expected. Let's see whether I forgot. No, there's the popularity of NetBeans and Spring Boot. And um, if you are a NetBeans uh, fan, you should listen to the um, uh, latest AHEX.FM podcast. So um, I would say see you next month and at AHEX Live. So there are already uh, enough registrations. So both workshops are guaranteed to run because um, we have um, there are already sufficient registrations. So. I think uh, this time I will close the, uh, the 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 registration if we reach 25. I hope. <laughs> Usually I never did it because I get always uh, uh, last time, uh, last minute, not last time, last minute uh, registration. So. Um, Florin asked me, hi Adam, you mentioned something about opening a debug port on EC2. Is it possible to do the same from QA uh, port? Uh, absolutely. We did it actually on, on, on OpenShift and OpenShift is Kubernetes. And um, it is even, I always forget whether it is OpenShift or Kubernetes. It is, uh, uh, you can even um, have port forwarding automatically. So you can uh, set up your IDE to localhost, let's say 5000, and it redirects it to your port. So it's absolutely possible. Uh, possible. And we, I didn't use it for debugging. I used to connect, you know, to the admin console to connect to, to databases, for instance. Um, yeah, so it will absolutely work. So thank you. 
for watching. And by the way, I really like the, the chat. Subscribe to Airhex News because I will uh, uh, I will announce Airhex News. Yeah, I will announce the uh, upcoming events here. And if you like, join the Airhex group. And um, yeah, it is uh, what I do with it. I announced you know the the, the commercial workshops and um, also conferences. So I'm, for instance, the upcoming uh, Java Land conference. So the first time I will speak at Java Land uh, remotely. So um, this this should be fun, and there are also other interesting conferences on the horizon. So thank you, and see you in February. Bye.